Shabbat shalom to all of you. I am so glad to be here with you this morning. That's a little bit uh, gray uh, Shabbat, but we are glad that we are all here together. You know, we are getting now to this special uh, portion, parasha, it's called Hukat, the ordinance that the, the Creator gives to his people. The Hukat, according to our sages, has been defined as something that doesn't have a logical explanation. I would like to say it in the way. You know, do you remember when I spoke to, to you about the Ten Words or the Ten Commandments? And we divide it in three parts. The first part was the misvotes or the directly the commandment. And there were the three commandments there that there were specifically a relationship of the Creator with us and us with the Creator. The second portion, the all we call it hukim, uh, or the, this ordinance that don't has a logical sometimes explanation. And in the fourth and fifth command, a, a commandment or principle that the Torah has given to us, and we call it hukim, and this is the keeping the Shabbat and honoring father and mother. The honoring father and mother sounds more logical, but uh, at the end, it is something that brings to us personally blessings, not to our parents, to us. And this is the reason that is so important. And finally, we had a five uh, uh, le uh, rest, uh, left uh, commandments, or, and we call it mishpatim, or judgments. And this is more a relationship, like the first part is the creator with us and us with the creator. The second part is uh, we are the, we ourselves, a relationship with ourselves. The third part, it is us with our neighbor and our neighbor with us. Then this idea that our rights end when the rights of somebody else begin and that we need to be contemplative of the rights of our neighbors and to be respectful of them. This is so important to see it. Now, we have here Hukat. And uh, Hukat, this, uh, the uh, para aduma, the, um, the, the red cow, we, we can translate it in that way. And this is a, something that uh, we do not have a clear explanation about it, but uh, the similitudes of this ritual with previous, uh, first of all, with the waters of uh, for the um, for the wife that is uh, no supposedly it is not faithful, you know the uh, the sota, and also uh, has a relationship with the leprosy or the cleansing uh, process. Then uh, will give us an idea. And here the para aduma has double purpose. Sometimes that we can see it. One is about to cleanse ourselves from the touching of a corpse, uh, a dead body. And the second one is about uh, to be right before the Creator We are a relationship with Him. You know, um, people call it forgiveness of sin, but I, I, will, I like to call hata'a more as a purging ourselves from anything that we have inside. Now, this is the, this portion we have talked many, many times, and I'm going to go to the next portion. In chapter 20, interestingly enough, we are going to have, a, and uh, this is the area that I'm going to speak a little bit more, and then we have the waters of Merivah. Also, in this portion, do you remember I said to you, this portion is very interesting, this uh, parasha, because the para aduma is considered as part of the first two years after the Jexia or the getting out from Egypt. Then, then when they were still at Har Sinai on the, uh, the mountain of Sinai. And now, suddenly, chapter 20 makes a big jump, you know? And it's going to jump 38 years. And it's going to be now in the in the process of the conquering of the promised land. And in this process, now is talking, and this is something that we need to be observant, uh, to observe in, in the writing. They are, they are talking now, no any longer, Moshe Rabbeinu, 
and our Creator giving to Moshe Rabbeinu instruction, is not talking any longer we, the past generation or the first generation. Now it's totally exclusively talking with the first generation. Or the, uh, se sorry, the second generation. Then uh, all, of, all the people have passed away. And here we are going to see the death of Miriam and also the passing of Aaron and also the announcements of Moshe uh, Ravenu also dying, you know? And this is a, a, a very crucial portion. And we need to look at with certain uh, expectative, but at the same time, we need to understand what is going on. Principle, I have been telling you about the Torah and more than giving you rules and regulations, as many of us, we are accustomed by being directed by religious people. The Torah is really, what it is, is a book of principles. Okay, this, this is very important. The way of life. And we need to learn to apply these principles, especially for today. Many things that we are reading today and we go to the, to the scriptures, they don't make sense to us for today until we find the principle. And this is what is so important. I mentioned to you when we did, we did the Ten Commandments or the Ten Words. You remember when we were talking in the book of Shemo, in the book of Jitro, in the Parasha of Jitro. I mentioned to you that the Ten Commandments are the basic of the whole Torah. And, 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 and they're the basic principles. And everything else is a particular application of these Ten Commandments. It's applications. They are all applying the Ten Commandments. Then we can still today keep on applying these Ten Commandments. Okay? And we need to look at from the perspective of today. And many times we cannot get stuck on the past. Uh, I always say that our God is the God of the past, present, and future. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, for the Creator, there is no past present and future, because he's eternal. It's us that we are the ones that we are ho uh, hooked to time. And, and because we are hooked to time, sometimes it's very difficult to change our minds, our mentalities. For a long time, I have been teaching you about, or sharing with you in a better way, about the uh, paradigm shift. Because we want it or not, we have too many principles in our head, too many ideas that have been put in our heads. You know, they, they are no any longer, uh, I would say, no, no even, uh, they, they don't make sense until we understand it. And also, we have learned through religion, not through the principle of the scripture, many things. We have accepted many things by religious people. This is the reason, by the way, that there is no one religion. We have been flooded by many religions. And every religion has, all of them, they have, all the religions, they have something in common. They are the only ones that are true, and they are the only ones that have the true God, and they are the only ones that uh, they take you to the paradise. I am so glad that biblical Judaism doesn't teach you that. Biblical Judaism, what it teaches you, yes, there is only one God, creator of every, everything, and we call it the creator. He is, blessed be his name, the, the one that made us, all of us. And all is all of us were his creation. And he doesn't make differentiation between one and the other. What he makes a differentiation is about roles and, and principles. What is your role in life? What are you have been chosen to do? And this is another term that we use for Israel, the chosen people. They are chosen for what? To do something very special, to represent the creator in an, in an area that is very special, is being called or legoyim. And what is the, the, the light to the people? The light is not themselves. The light is what they carry, it is the Torah. And we have been hiding the Torah and, and, and from everybody, like a, it's for, only for us and not for the world. And that's what our Messiah, Yeshua, came to do. He 
the first thing that he said was, well, the, the, the light, you cannot hide it, you cannot put it under something. No, you need to put it in the top and show to everybody. Uh, and this is who we are. That is the responsibility that we have, to show the light. And how we show the light? By leaving the Torah. And how do you, that is when you call Shomer Torah, a, a living Torah. And the living Torah doesn't mean to be religious, as many men. Doesn't mean that you have a long peos, and you have a, a long beard, or you have a kippah, or you have a talit. You know, many people think, or you dress in, with, with a uniform. That, that's not what the creator, to us, to show the presence of the creator, it is not by, by the uniform. It's by what you have inside and comes out. That is the true Shomer Torah. When people can see you and can say, this is a true man or woman of God. And, and this is the, why it's so important to understand all these principles. And we need to start little by little to get rid of a lot of nonsense, you know, that impose on people a lot of limitations. And you become more a, 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 re, a re, recluse. A, a, a prisoner of, of people instead to be enjoying the freedom that the Creator gives to you to exercise your free will. You know, the, the, um, the behirah of she, the free will. Then, now, we, are, we have passed 38 years, and now we are now in the preamble of the entering in the promised land. And what is going to happen with the second generation? They are going to find a lot of people that were there, a lot of tribes and civilizations that were there when, when the Israelites, they left that area. You know, many of them are relatives of, a, of the Israel. Moab is a relative, Ammon is a relative. You know, they are all relatives. The Edom are relatives who they didn't let, let them pass and they needed to circulate around the, the area, their, their own family. That, that tells you about how uh, difficult it was for them, because we can say are the enemies. Today we can relate it in something similar. Our arch enemies, and I don't know why, are the so-called the Arabs, uh, the Muslim people, you know? And they have such dislike for Israel, they want to see Israel destroyed. And we are, people say, we are cousins. We are more than cousins. We're half brothers. You know? And, and, and this is something that is, is so sad. Because there is one side that doesn't want to know anything about the other. And, and the one that wants to look in for peace is the one that is put it down. And, and you see how the world looks and how the world has their own way of seeing and their own mentality. Well, here, uh, Moshe Rabenu is going to face something about this idea that they, 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 they call the, the area of Meribah, you know, the, 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 the problem that they have because of the lack of water and the complaint of Israel. And basically, again, like I was talking to you before, Moshe Rabenu lose his temper. And losing his temper at this time he takes away the possibility to be presented or to go to take his people to the promised land. Now, he will be terminated in his role as the leader of Israel, and he's going to pass the batuta, the, 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 baton. the baton, he's going to pass to Yehoshua, Joshua, no, Yeshua. And he is going to take the, the people of Israel to conquer the promised land. There are very interesting things that comes here. Uh, first of all, there is a question about why the Creator is so hard with Moshe Rabenu. He lost his temper, okay, but uh, he had not served the, uh, the Creator all these last 40 years in an exemplary way, and only because he lost his temper, he's going to lose the opportunity to get in, in the promised land. You know, our sages, many of them, they have different 
uh, positions and different. One say because of lack of faith, another say it because of disobedience, another say that uh, he put himself instead of God and all those things. The scripture, sometimes they explain themselves and you don't need to go too far away. If we read carefully here, he say, uh, the Lord spoke to Moses and said, take the branch and call the community together. You and your brother Aaron, then in full view of them, uh, order, order this rock to release its water. And you will release the water from the rock for them and provide a drink for the community and their livestock. One of the Midrashim, they tell you that the reason they didn't have any longer water is because Miriam died. And Miriam was the, uh, was the one that because of Miriam's life, they had always water. Sometimes some Midrashim, they say that there was a rock that followed them wherever they went. You know, that's the rock that she touched. Others say that was a, a pool that followed them everywhere that they went. Whatever was the case, Supposedly because Miriam died, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the water stopped fluid, uh, fluid, uh, the fluidity to, to the people of Israel. Now, one of the reasons that they put this uh, together is because the, in the word Miriam, the word ma'in, the, the word uh, water is included, no? Uh, there. Okay. <coughs> Let me go back to, to the point of what I was reading. And then Moses, verse uh, 9 and 10, the chapter 20. And Moses took up the branch from before the Lord as he had directed him. And Moses then, uh, Moses and Aaron, uh, very important here, uh, the description that he's saying is, he doesn't say only Moshe. He says, Moshe? and Aaron, in order to, that you can see that both of them, they were playing a very important role. And Moshe and Aaron uh, then called uh, the assembly together in front of the rock. And he then said to them, listen now, you rebels. Many say it, they say that because he called them rebels, that was the, the punishment. Because the, the Jewish people were so good. Mm. You know, we need to be careful that Israel was not an example you know, right now. We have seen before and we're going to see later on how they continue with the problems of their fathers. Okay? And that was not the reason why he lost this. But uh, that's one explanation that he gave. Shall we make water gush? from this rock for you. Look at what he say. Shall we, who? Moshe and Aaron will make gush water for you. Okay? Hold that idea. And Moshe then raised his hand and struck the rock twice. Not even one. Twice. No? With a branch, with a baton, with with, with a staff. with a staff, and water gush out in abundance, and the community was so happy, and they rejoiced, and they were drunk. Very important. To whom the glory was given to. What the people of Israel at the moment thought. You know, there are many religions that adjudicate to the spoker, a spoken, a spoken, a spoken person for the creator or the mediator for the creator. They, they give it to the, the mediator. They give it a divine attitude or position, and he is the one that does the miracles. And they, they take the credit that they are making the miracles, and they forget to give it the honor and the glory to the creator. Okay? Now, let me uh, go now to, to, to the same chapter, but I'll jump to chapter 22. Verse 22. 
20, chapter 20, verse 22. And he said, they set out from Kadesh Barnea, where they were, and the Israelites, the whole community, came to Mount Hort. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in Mount Hort, on the frontier of Edom, and said, Aaron is to be gathered to his people. Underline this, it's very interesting statement. And Aaron will be gathered to his people. Okay? He will not enter the country which I have given to the Israelites. Saints, you both, who are the both? Moshe and Aaron. Okay? You both disobey my order at the waters of Meribah. Again. Take Aaron and his father Eliezer and bring uh, his son Eliezer, uh, take Aaron and his son Eliezer, and bring them up to the Mount Hor. And then take Aaron's robes of him and dress his son Eliezer in them. And Aaron then will be gathered to his people. This, this means that he will die. So, dead in here in the Torah represents that you have passed from one side to the other side. Okay? That doesn't mean the fi finality or disappearance. What it means is you have passed from one side to another. That's the idea for us about death. Okay. There are, uh, interestingly enough, Moshe Rabbeinu has many, in, in the book of the Barim, the Deuteronomy, First of all, uh, in the first chapter, verse, uh, I want to start for verse 34. The Lord heard what you were saying, and his anger swore this oath. No one of these people, this perverse generation, will see the fine country, and I swore to give your ancestor, except Caleb and Jephunet. He's talking about the first generation. Okay? And then he say, He will see it. To him and to his children, I shall give the land that he has set foot on, for he has been perfectly obedient to the Lord. Okay? The Lord was angry with me too, because of you. That's what I call it, I call it passing the buck. Okay, and I want that you see about Moshe Rabenu as a real leader, but as an, also as a real man. He was not perfect. He was very special and very great. You see, there is no perfection in humanity. We human beings, we are not perfect. That's the reason that we had the opportunity to evolve and to grow and to be every time better and better. What will happen if we were perfect? What do we need as a creator? What do we need anything else? We are perfect. Anyway, and he said, uh, you will not go either, he said, and your assistant Joshua, Song Nun, will be the one to enter, encourage him, and say he is going to bring Israel into possession of the country. And your little ones too, who you say will be saved as a beauty, this is, these children of yours who do not yet know good from evil, they will go in. I shall give it to them, this place. Okay? He's talking about the next generation. Then, uh, later on, he... Uh, He's going to talk about um, the, let me, to chapter three, okay. Uh, 
allá en Deuteronomio. ¿Ok? Verses 23 and 24, chapter 3. I then pleaded with the Lord, my Lord God, and I say, now that you have begun to reveal your greatness and your power to your servant with works and mighty deeds, no God in heaven, on earth, and rival may I not go across and see the fine country on the other side of the Jordan, that fine and upland country and the Lebanon. But because of you, again, because of you, the Lord was angry with me and will not listen. And he will say to me, Basta! Enough! Enough! It's enough! And he said, do not mention the subject again. Climb to the top of the peace God. Turn your eyes to the west, the north, and the south. And look well, for across this Jordan you shall not go. And give Joshua again destruction. At the end of the Barim, chapter 31, the final verses of 31 from 48, he said, And the Lord spoke to Moses that same day. And say to him, climb this mountain of the Abarim, Mount of Nebo, in the country of Moab. You want to know what Moab is? It's Transjordania, it's Jordan. Okay? And, and this is very interesting how this uh, region is, is, is talked. And that is where uh, when he went to, uh, they went to, uh, to conquer Arab and they returned back to uh, Eilat and they call it the, the seed of Suf. And this is the real one that they cross, not the other side that is supposedly that they cross, but this is the side that they cross close to Saudi Arabia. Anyway, that is another talk. But I think the Lord spoke to Moses and said to them, climb the mountain to Abarim and Nebo in the country of Moab, opposite to Jericho, and view the Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites as their domain died on the mountain that you have climbed and be gathered to your people as your brother Aaron died in the mount of Hor and was gathered to his people. Because with the other Israelites, you broke faith with me at the waters of Meribah in Kadesh and the desert of Sin because you did not make my holiness clear to the Israelites. You may only see the country from outside you cannot enter in it, the country which I have been given to the Israelites. I have given you enough uh, pieces in the, in the puzzle in order that you understand this part. The great failure of Moshe Ravenu not to be able to get in, in the promised land was that he did not give the honor and glory to the Creator in the moment of losing his temper. By the way, that is the reason it's so important to keep your temper. You know, I, I tell everybody that one day I was driving a car, and I usually I don't like that nobody cross me, you know, and I get temperamental. And then I cross the man again who crossed me, and I start saying to him, what in the world you are doing? And roll my, my wind. A rabbi saying that. Oh, the rabbi needs to be holy. How can you do that? And the man look at me and say, I am so sorry, sir. I didn't see you. Please forgive me. You know, in that moment, all my anger, all my furious uh, uh, stage, you know, poof. And I felt so guilty that I couldn't stop asking forgiveness uh, to him, and but especially to the Creator. What a terrible, terrible image I gave. Rabbi. Also, that kept me very humble because it made me see, feel like I am very human, and I am very limited. Moshe Rabbeinu lost his temper. 
and losing his temper gave the impression to these people they are very wishy-washy, okay? That they are not totally sure about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. One time they are faithful, one time they are unfaithful. One time they, they declare his greatness, one time say, let's go back to, to Egypt. You know, all those things. And what happened? In that moment, he took the glory of God for himself. I always say to people, when you talk about and God does something good, they never look at what I did. You always need to say, look at what the Creator is doing. Blessed be his name. He is the one that does everything. Give it the glory to him, not to yourself. And, and why he was not allowed, and I like this portion for some of the sages say this idea too. Is because if he crossed the border with the people of Israel, they will almost immediately make him a god. And how I can see that? You know, it's very interesting. There are many religions that they has this capability to transform a human being in God. And you know, and they put it in a position greater than God himself. And here, he, Moshe Rabbeinu, was not allowed to go to the promised land because he went to the promised land, so they will make, erect him not only as a hero, but they will make him as a god. He had the capability to bring water with his own hands. He was a miracle worker. Later on, we see those things in other situations, in other people, other religions. And after that, it's going to come the, the, the episode of the bronze snake, you know? And this bronze, bronze snake has created also many, many misunderstandings. I hope they have a few, uh, have a little bit of time to give you only an overview about this problem. Okay? This is in chapter 22. No, per, I'm sorry, chapter 21. What are you doing? What am I saying? Chapter 21. Uh, the bronze serpent. Uh, from they were, uh, chapter 21 talks around from Arad. And you need to understand something about Arad. Arad is a, is a place that is just prior to the Dead Sea, in case that you, you need to, and this is already in the territory of Israel. And I, and I wonder you picture this because uh, when you see, you have the Jordan River, Transjordan is after the Jordan River to, to the east, and to the west is the part that is Israel. And imagine they are in Arad. And Arad, from Arad, you go down directly to the, the sea. Arad was a town that was a, a, a place of the, was the copper mines or bronze mines, you know? And, and they say that there were a lot of snakes. And the locals, they would use, a, what do you call it, a, a, totems, what, what do you call it? Uh, huh? Amulets. Amulets, that's the term amulets, and, and they will do serpents of bronze. In that way, they will avoid that the serpent will, will uh, kill them. Now, they're called seraph nahash. Seraph means uh, 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 something that bruises, something that is uh, fiery, you know? Uh, and nahash is serpent. It, I mean, it's the serpent that burn you, okay? And when they bite you, they kill you. And we, we see that uh, in chapter 8 of the Deuteronomy, when Moshe Rabbeinu said we took it from the land, that there were uh, the scorpions and the, and the snakes, and you were not killed. You know, God protect you. And this moment, because of the dis disobedience of the people of Israel, the Creator allowed the serpent to bite them. And then he, he took uh, a serpent of bronze, and he said to the people, 
to, to Moses to say to the people, all of you that have been beaten by the serpent, if you look at this serpent of bronze that I am holding in my uh, road, you will be healed. And you know, and today the, all the medical institution they has as a, as a sign, you know, a, a snake uh, 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 the, that you look at, you are, you are healed. Well, I always say the Aduma para, the, uh, the para Aduma, and the Nahash, the Seraph Nahash, all these ideas were like a borrowing from the pagan world, and the creator was sanitizing them, taking their power of hocus pocus and giving the impression that he was the one that was giving the, uh, he had the power, that was trusting in him, in the creator. Now, in chapter 18 of the second Kings, Melachim Bet, okay, you, you're going to see a very interesting story about the Nahash. Uh, verses, um, verses four, you know, um, you, you, chapter 18, and saying, uh, this is the, in the third year, uh, I'm going to read from the beginning, in the third year of Hosea, son of La, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, became king of Judah, and he was 25 years old when he came to the throne. And he reigned for 29 years in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what the Lord regards as right, just as his ancestor David has done. And he abolished the high places, broke the pillars, cut down the sacred poles, those beams that they, they created uh, uh, all the pagan world, and look at how, how Israel was involved in paganism at that time already. And he said, and he smashed the bronze serpent which Moses has made for up to that time the Israelites has offered sacrifices to it and was called Nehushtan. In the Hebrew, this is a play of words. Nehushtan, what comes from the word bronze, okay? Um, you can call it a, a Nehoshet is, is bronze, and Nahash is serpent. And you can see the plates of words. They're all coming from the same, the, the, the serpent's bronze. Now, that to tell you about how Israel can fall in idolatry. Because sometimes we have in our imagination, we think that Israel was perfect. I am telling you that Israel had a lot of mistakes. I still have it today, but I still the people of God. Um, and there is a book that is very interesting that many of you maybe do not know. Is the Shlomo Hosman. This is the, the Wisdom of Solomon. And this is a, a deuterocanonical book that's called in, in Christianity. And, and this book is, is, a, is a Jewish book, but I was not in the, in the uh, uh, was not accepted by uh, when they made the the uh, the codex, the the, the twenty four books of the Tanakh was not included. You know, Johann, uh, Jonathan, uh, Johannan, uh, what is the um, my 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 head went, went in blank. Before Akiva, este, John Sakai, uh, ben, ben Sakai, Yohanan Ben Sakai, I'm sorry, I went in, in blank. Yohanan uh, Ben Sakai was the one that formed the, the, the uh, made the, the books of the scripture, the word 24, who are equal to the 39 of the, the Protestant Bible, only divided in different ways. And here, 
in chapter 16 of this book of wisdom of Solomon, I want to read to you from verse 5. Okay, but I'm going to get to the point. He say, even when the fearful rage of wild animals overtook them and they were perishing from the bites of the writhing snakes, your retribution did not continue to the end. Affliction struck them briefly by a way of warning, and they had a saving token to remind them of the commandment of the Torah. For whoever turned to it, to the snake, was saved. But not, we say, not by what they look, but they were saved by the Lord. Adonai, blessed be his name. The Savior of all. This is why in the, what we call it the Messianic writings, or also in Christianity they call it the New Testament, they has a portion there in the fourth have a Sorah or gospel, and they say, there, to me it's a misquote about what Yeshua say, but they have put it there. And they, and they replace here the Lord for Yeshua. And he is talking very clear about God, not Yeshua. That's how the theology, like many times I have told you, you know, I have told you that the theology, it is a, uh, an instrument to try to make you believe on something that is pure human interpretation, but it is not God's revelation. And many of us, we are more influenced by theology than by the pure Torah and the pure Word of God. And we give more credit to human beings down to the Creator. That's the reason that Jeremiah Hanavi, the prophet Jeremiah, what he say? Cursed be the man who trusts in men, but blessed be the man who trusts in the Creator, in God. And I always end it in this way. Who do you have believed? Are you believe men or you believe the Creator? This is the reason that we have so many religions. Because each man is going to bring their own message. And there is only one message. It's the Creator who gave us life and makes us all of them. And many things that are applicable to that time, with the time we need to understand that there are different things that we need to progress and we need to open our minds to understand the principle, not to be hooked to the letter. It's my desire that all of us, we keep growing in the revelation of the Creator and that we can apply for us for our lives today. As I try trying to explain to you why Moshe Rabbeinu was not allowed to come to the Promised Land was not because of his sin in the, in the way that he was a uh, lack of faith or, or, or he, he lost his temper. It was because not giving the honor and the glory to the Creator, created an idea to the people of Israel that he was the one, that he was the miracle worker. And then because of that, that was not his intention. That's very important to understand. But uh, because of that, the people of Israel will make him a god. And you have seen in most of the religions that we have today, they have made a man god. And there is only one creator. There is only one almighty one, blessed be his name. And there is no other like him. There is no substitute for him, and we cannot change him. And that is Adonai Sebaot our God of the armies. Shabbat Shalom.